We are the Napa Valley Wine Academy. My name is Emily Lester. I'm the social media manager and the French wine correspondent. And today we are doing an interview with Beanie Espy. And I'm very excited. We're gonna be talking about Sherry, some of the history behind Sherry. And for those of you that are joining us and don't know about the Napa Valley Wine Academy, we offer classes online worldwide at 10 different locations. We are the WSCT leader in the US successfully certifying more students anywhere outside of London. All of our WSET courses include wine kits that we ship directly to your home. And aside from our certification courses, we also have a variety of proprietary expert level programs. We also offer free webinars, podcasts, articles, and more. And our guest today is actually going to be publishing an article on our blog, so make sure to check that out. All of the information will be for you in the show notes or the captions or wherever you find your content from the Napa Valley Wine Academy. The best thing to do is sign up for our newsletter so you can stay in the know and learn all the things about our upcoming sales and promotions and all those incredible things that we offer for our students that are resources for our followers and our audience as well. So today uh, she's joining me from London. Welcome, thank you. The hello you. little spiel there. I'm delighted to have you. This is a special edition to honor also women who work in wine in the month of March because it's Women's History Month, the month of March. Because we wanna dive a little bit deeper into the world of Sherry. We had a very successful webinar with Ben Hopkins in partnership with the Academy du Vent Library. And he published a book, Sherry, Misaligned and Misunderstood and Magnificent. So we thought it was perfect to invite you to come on and be a guest with us and share some of your information and some of your special cocktails. So welcome, <laughs> Beanie. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, I mean, Ben is somebody I've known for a long time. In fact, he and my mother met many years ago working at what was then IDV, um, both working for Croft. So my mum was working for Croft, Port and Sherry, and as was he. And that, funnily enough, is sort of where my whole Sherry story began, um, indirectly with Ben. So it's a real, it's a real pleasure. Yeah, and to have that have that special that special connection <laughs> absolutely absolutely so I actually studied um I studied Spanish at, at university and uh one of the requirements of my degree course was that we had to spend some time overseas um and so through a contact of of mum um I got an interview with Gonzalez Bias mm -hmm. um who are the makers of Tio Pepe amongst many other wonderful wines um, and went down and spent uh, the best part of six months in in the south of Spain, Andalusia, um, working as a marketing uh, intern for them. Um, and that's really where the whole Sherry journey began. So um, that's going back 20 years now, which is faintly terrifying. Um, well, not quite 20 years, but almost 20 years. Um, and so it's been, yeah, Zeco, which is the brand obviously that I now run and which we'll talk about, I'm sure, um, is very much the realization of a, of a long dream. So it's an exciting time for me personally and for the Sherry category in general. Have all those things come together. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So let's talk a little bit about the history of Sherry before we begin. And I want to know a lot more about your, your personal wine journey, but let's just talk a little bit about and that and specifically Sherry cocktails and that relationship you had in your article. So tell sure. me. Sure. So, I mean, Sherry is a, is an incredibly um, prestigious region. I mean, some people don't realize that, you know, just as champagne can only be called champagne if it comes from champagne uh, and same with cognac, Sherry is similarly a protected region. So uh, Sherry wines have to be made within the denomination of origin um, within the Sherry Triangle, um, which encompasses three cities, um, Jerez de la Frontera, Jerez is actually a derivation of the Moorish word Sherish, so Sherry, Jerez, Sherish essentially all mean one and the same. Um, and then you've got uh, San Lucar de Barameda, which is famously where Manzanilla comes from. Um, and then you have the third part of the triangle, which is El Puerto de Santa Maria. So mm. all the sherries that you see um, on your shelves are, are made in, in, in that protected region, which is actually the oldest denomination of origin in Spain and one of the oldest in Europe. So from a sort of cultural point of view, um, Sherry Jerez is, is very important to our kind of European wine landscape. Um, and there have been, I mean, they've been producing wine in the region since Moorish times. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, one of the stories that we plot through on our, on our bottles, which all have historical characters, 
is the story of Alfonso X, um, which is partly where we get the X for our brand, okay. brand who, who brokered the first um, barter, which was Spanish wine for English wool back in the, the 12th century, 12th, 13th century. So there really is this incredible kind of timeline of, of sherry being drunk and enjoyed, um, particularly on British shores, but obviously also on other European shores and, and, um, and further afield. So Sherry's had a lovely long, long her, um, sort of heritage and, and for many years was kind of, you know, the wine to drink, mm. drink. Um, and one of the things I touched on in my article is that um, Sherry's also been an absolute sort of staple of cocktail making for a very yeah. long time. The Sherry cobbler, uh, and there are plenty of derivations of that available today, um, was introduced, I think, in the 1820s. So that was by a, but in the US cocktail market, which is obviously, you know, incredibly sort of the sort of cradle of cocktail making as we know it today. Um, and so Sherry's been a kind of a hugely important part of our kind of liquid cultural landscape, if you like, for a very long time. <laughs> I um, love that liquid cultural <laughs> landscape. Just, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's a new one. That's a new one. Well. Um, and so, you know, the, the emphasis for us with Zecco was to help kind of contemporary consumers today who, who, you know, let's be honest, it's not so much that they dislike sherry, uh, sherry mm -hmm. a bit of an image problem, um, yeah. but not dissimilar to the way that gin did years ago when it was very much my grandparents drink um you know things are there's always this element of sick you know cyclical ups and downs um with wines and spirits and sherry you know has been has been in a bit of a trough for a while but um we're seeing some amazing shoots of recovery across the board um which we can obviously talk about in more detail so you know we're really excited and and very confident that the sherry renaissance is is beginning and is, is going to really you know, kick into gear imminently and definitely a vessel for that would be cocktails. Like an organization like yours is really innovating and helping elevate that status and that that change in that renaissance quite a bit. What was, how was that, what was the impetus for that? How did that all start where you had that interest in wine and in sherry in particular with your background and your education? And then what have brought about creating this organization that you now have? So the, the, the dream was really born, funnily enough, in Hong Kong, where I met my two co-founders. And Polly still lives in Hong Kong today. Alexa and I are both now based in London. We were on a junk of all things, which is a sort of classic Hong Kong experience. You go out on a boat, everyone's drinking cocktails or spritzes. Okay. And we were thinking, what I really want right now is a rebujito, which is this um, classic Andalusian mixture of essentially fino sprite ice mint super delicious very refreshing and the kind of young person's way of drinking sherry during the festival seasons of april may june in in the south of spain where it's incredibly hot and also to be honest you're partying from about three in the afternoon till at least three in the morning so you need something that's kind of got yeah, um, yeah gonna keep you hydrated <laughs> <laughs> So the Rebujito's got this kind of cult kind of status during those festival seasons. And we were, we were all talking about how that's exactly what we wanted to be drinking in this balmy, you know, temperatures in, in, in Hong Kong. But sherry just wasn't readily available in Hong Kong and people just didn't really think to drink it. Mm. So the three of us were talking about this issue, having all kind of come to sherry in different ways. So I, I touched on the fact that I'd actually worked in the South of Spain. My first love was Tio Pepe. You know, I'm still a huge supporter of, of Gonzalez Bias and all that they're doing across the sherry kind of gamut. Um, and Alexa and Polly had both really come to it through their WSCT and, and kind of been startled by how much they liked it and how little they'd really known about it before they yeah. did their, their, their WSCT courses. So we actually hosted a dinner um, where we did a sort of seven course food pairing, got a friend of ours who was a WSCT certified um, educator to come and basically guide everyone through a tasting. And at the end of the supper, everyone was like, wow, there's so much more to this category than I could possibly have realized. This is super cool. And so we kind of sat around thinking, what can we do in our own small but hopefully meaningful way to kind of bring more awareness and attention to this category? Because it is generally really beloved of bartenders and sommeliers and people who work in the industry. But the kind of broader consumer base, as I mentioned earlier on, just doesn't feel necessarily that it's relevant to them. And we looked at what was happening in 
in Kenneth already and in the Sherry Triangle already. And there were, and there are today, this plethora of amazing winemakers doing spectacular things. Um, you know, the latest, probably most sort of celebrated name is Peter Sisek of, of, of Pingus fame, who's now created his own, Port mm. de and is creating his own Fino. But there are, you know, in numerous other amazing producers doing beautiful things, whether it's um, non-fortified wines, um, single estate, Finos. I mean, there's a lot happening down there. And so we felt that actually the sort of, fine dining element of sherry which I could talk about for hours but that's not really what we're here to do <laughs> was so well taken care of but what was missing was a brand that could kind of educate cut through mm -hmm. um, and just kind of speak a language to somebody who maybe wouldn't identify as a wine lover or a, or a connoisseur but who wanted to, looking for something a bit more sort of approachable because the challenge with sherry, truthfully, is it's just very complicated. You know, the driest wines in the world are sherries, the sweetest wines in the world are sherries. Right. Um, and so sherry as a sort of collective noun is actually just quite challenging, actually, um, because it can kind of really send people off in, in kind of complicated journeys. So having weighed it all up, we decided that actually what we felt there was a space for in the market was a brand that told the unique sherry story in a very simple way that was very focused on its objectives. And our objective is primarily to bring dry sherry to a modern day consumer, because we feel it, those are the wines that have the most relevance today. Mm -hmm. um, and also because there is this versatility, not just about drinking them neat, obviously that's, you know, as a wine enthusiast, as a sherry enthusiast, that's largely what I do, but there is also this, this scope to create some amazing cocktails. Um, yeah. And in particular, to create some amazing spritzes, um, and in this kind of you know very mindful, health conscious, calorie conscious, wellness conscious landscape that we now operate in, dry sherry is a spectacular option. Um, yes. So, so we kind of felt that that Seco had a unique proposition, which is to focus on on cocktails and on dry styles, and to just kind of have a very clear defining yeah purpose really yes and the three of you got together so you have three yeah three three women <laughs> entrepreneurs getting together and, and creating creating a Zeko Zeko wines which yes. is so we we did touch on this the idea of making you touch on it making sherry approachable but then also its relationship like I think we mentioned this earlier is kind of it's similar to port in that regard where it's kind of seen as of something for the older generation. And have you found that that's also been true with the different producers that you work with in Spain and like helping them also elevate it and find new ways to make cocktails and to make it approachable in that regard? And how has that relationship been with the different producers that you've had in Spain as well? Like how so, are you in that? I mean, I think, you know, there has been a progressive premiumization of Sherry. Mm -hmm. um, a recognition that people are looking and are prepared to pay for premium sort of more craft wines. Um, the simple truth is that sherry by its very nature is already, you know, in terms of how it's made and in terms of the time and the effort and the energy that goes into it, a premium product. I mean, you know, no Fino is gonna arrive before it's been aged for a minimum of three or four years, yeah. which is very distinct from a kind of white wine that you're going to buy from other regions of Spain and other regions of Europe. So the investment of time and energy in creating that wine in the first place should already be giving it a sort of premium status. But the reality is that it is to this day still quite inexpensive. Um, and reputationally, I think that has a few that has a few issues and economically that has a few issues as well. So there's been a sort of an awareness that actually the category ben would benefit from some premiumization. And there's been some wonderful innovation in that regard um, in terms of the kind of Enrama styles of sherry, which we're seeing. Um, Gonzalez has developed this sort of Palmas. Well, they didn't develop it, but they certainly marketed this sort of Palmas system where you really understand the nuances between the different types of Fino and the amount of aging and, and where they are in the whole Solera process. So there has been a lot of innovation, and I think you know um, all the all the major brands are doing some beautiful things within that space. Um, but I think what we feel is that that has been very effective in bringing wine lovers, sherry lovers, and in particular lapsed sherry consumers mm. back to the category and encouraging them to expand their basket, to have a broader range of sherries at home, and to drink more widely around the category. But our feeling is that those products do not 
fundamentally bring new people in. That it's already a complicated category and then you layer yet more layers of complexity on top of it. And actually that just in many ways puts more barriers up than it takes down. So that's a really valuable and necessary exercise in terms of, you know, kind of bringing back sherry to the kind of world stage as a, as a premium and prestigious and important wine on every, every restaurant and in every table. But I think there is still this place for, for, a, for a brand that just tells a more simple story. Mm-hmm. So yes, there's a lot of innovation happening. And I think that's fantastic and positive. And I mean, sherry um, in, t- in value terms has, has really started to turn the corner and has now been on the ascendant for several years. But volume has still been tricky. And I think that's where we felt that a more kind of um, approachable offering was really what needed to happen. Um, and so we're working with a winery who um, were actually established in, in the late 1800s. So they've got this incredible provenance, but they really understood and shared our sort of our ambition for the category. And they saw the place that our wines had alongside their own stable of wines is quite distinctive. Um, so we, we work with one winery specifically, um, and there's a fantastic winemaker and a brilliant team. And we obviously work very closely with them in terms of selecting the wines from within their own Solera system. Um, but as I said, our, our message is, is, is a little bit different. Um, the cocktail message is one that I think, you know, brands like Lustau in particular have done a great job um, really kind of um, accelerating. Alista has great presence in North America in particular, I think, within that kind of cocktail culture. But, you know, someone said this analogy to me a little while back, actually an American lady I was speaking to, and she said, you know, a rising tide floats all boats. And I think that's the sense that we want to be, the more voices we have talking about the beauty of sherry and, and how relevant and necessary it is that, you know, that people, you know, understand it and choose to drink it. The more everyone will benefit. So our view is that you know, it's it's not a cluttered market. There was definitely place for Zeko to come and tell oh, a sure. story that's a bit different. Um, and hopefully, you know, we'll all we'll all reap the benefits when when more and more consumers kind of come back and re- reassess it. Um, so I think you know there is a culture of innovation. It's taken a while. You know, I think um, perhaps Andalusia and Sherry in particular has been a little bit slower than other regions to sort of realise the importance of innovation but they're making up for it in a big way. There's a, there's a lot of momentum and, um, and a lot more positive press. Um, so I'm really, as I said, I'm really optimistic that the future is very bright for the region and the category. I think, yeah, there's definitely a variety of factors too. I think that the rise also of wine education, more and more people that may not necessarily have thought much about Sherry, but then when they're studying it and just the, their coursework, oh, okay, maybe I'll dive a little bit more and more into that in particular. It does remind me, a lot too of champagne where you've got this, you've got champagne, it's a delineated zone. It's a very specific wine. It's, but at the same time, the more you dive into it, the more and more complex it can get. So it's very similar in that. And I know uh, Peter Liam also draws those parallels to those two regions. So I do, it's just kind of a matter of time where you see, yeah, tremendous rise in that and collectively bringing it to the forefront and having more awareness of that. So brands like yours, absolutely, I think, have a lot of room, a room and a place, a place at the table in that regard. I'm glad you made that parallel because I do think that there are lots of, there are lots of parallels from a sort of actual kind of vinification perspective, mm-hmm. but also I think from a sort of vitification perspective, because actually, you know, we've, we've talked about the fact that, you know, a long time ago, well, we haven't talked about it that much, but, you know, a long time ago, champagne was all about, you know, the way it was made and the way it was aged and the way, you know, but, th- and there wasn't that much focus really on the actual vines, <laughs> the kind of source exactly. wine. Yeah. And, and, and similarly in Sherry, you know, it was all about the bodega and you'd go down to Jerez and you would basically go and visit these beautiful cavernous aging warehouses or bodegas, but you'd never see a vineyard. You know, you were sort of, there was a bit of a disconnect between yeah. the actual source of the wine um, the table wines that go into it. And I think, you know, Champagne was, has been changing that narrative now for decades, but I think Sherry is finally beginning to change that narrative as well. And, and really remember that consumers as well want to understand that whole journey from, from, yeah. from grain, well, from, not from grain, sorry, from, I've got a whiskey project, which I'm doing this <laughs> um, you know, from, from, from grape to bottle. And yeah. that, you know, that, that whole story is, is, is massively important. So, there's so much positivity, I think, and so yeah. many positive improvements and, and shifts. And as I said, I, I, it's just a really exciting time to be to be involved. Um, but from us, from our perspective, it's it, it's really as I as I mentioned about showcasing versatility. So, mm-hmm. as a fortified wine, um, there's a lot more you can do with a bottle of Fino than you can do with a bottle of of you know, still white wine. Um, 
Absolutely. And, and one of the things we love to talk about is just that spritzes in particular are just an absolute no-brainer. I touched on the rebujito at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the thing about a spritz is that, you know, it's fortified. So it's got that kind of body. It's got the viscosity. It, it can hold its own within a long drink. But being 15% rather than a 40% gin vodka equivalent, yep. mm-hmm. you've got something that's readily quaffable. It's more like a beer, you know, in terms of its alcohol percentage. It's it's really refreshing. It kind of, you know, ticks all those boxes. And then the absolute kind of kicker is that it's super low in sugar. You know, it's yeah. one of, it's very, very, very low in residual sugar due to the way it, it's made. Um, so, you know, it really ticks a lot of important boxes for current consumers, but it hasn't been, you know, we haven't consciously created it to do that. That's just intrinsically, mm-hmm. those are core intrinsic values of the wine. Mm-hmm. Which I think is what's also really important because again, I think consumers want authenticity. You know, they want to know that this products that they're drinking are made authentically, properly with pedigree. They're not just kind of batch produced to tick some kind of commercial agenda. Like, and I think that's where Fino is uniquely well-placed to, to really serve the needs of consumers in a way that, you know, um, lots of other brands and products just aren't. Yeah, and I, and I think there's also more of an emphasis on the educated consumer too. Again, just going back to the idea of champagne, you know, there more and more people are talking about champagne and terroir of champagne where that conversation was, it wouldn't have happened even just 15 years ago. And uh, the sustainability, what's actually going on in the vines, it's important in the sellers, but people are asking more and more of those questions. And they're more conscious about yeah, environmental sustainability, their health, um, and all of that is more and more at the forefront. So with projects like yours, it, it does reach the consumer that does want a certain level of education or, or background about what it is that they're putting in their body and how, how it is that they're going to do that. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the other reasons that we were so drawn to working with our producer, because they are they're actually relatively small in terms of sherry production terms, but they have quite a lot of, of vines under under management. And there's a real emphasis on doing things, uh, you know, with a r- massive focus on quality, yeah, everything's handpicked, which I think is is important from a quality, quality point of view, but also from a kind of local community point of view. They're, you know, they're the big employers during the right, you know, harvest seasons. And I think that kind of understanding of the, of the need to focus on the detail. Mm-hmm. No, did I lose you? Hmm. We lost you like, yeah. for a minute, but I think yeah, I lost you too. There's a little bit, of, a little bit of a connection snap <laughs> there, but I think uh, I think it happens a couple. Got the gist. Yeah, exactly the gist. So, good spring. Um, just talking about today's market and the current climate, and the, you know, starting a business and the relationship to that yeah. in the pandemic. So how, how has the pandemic impacted your business? And do you think that there will be repercussions or what have been the repercussions in the last year on the, the sherry trade in particular? Well, I think, I mean, the, the Zecco business specifically has been quite severely impacted because we were so early in our journey um, and we were very much focusing our initial launch plans on the on trade and building a real rapport with bartenders and mixologists and sommeliers and helping them to understand our objectives and what we were trying to achieve. So, of course, when you shut down <laughs> the on trade, um, you know, so that's been a real challenge for us. Um, and truthfully, you know, we we didn't pivot as quickly as I would have liked onto online, partly because I had a baby last February. So Congratulations. <laughs> I was quite busy doing that. The the pandemic. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, and so, yeah, truthfully, we've been a bit slow to kind of pivot towards online sales and working directly with selling to consumers, but that's changing. And you know, we're now really well represented online. We now have an Amazon Prime listing. You know, things are moving in the right direction for us. So it's kind of slow and steady wins the race, I think. But actually for the sherry category as a whole, um, certainly in the UK, which remains the largest export market for sherry. I mean, it was one of the top performing categories in relative terms. Wow. Um, partly okay. I think because because people were expanding their drinks repertoires they were looking at drinks that they might normally only drink seasonally or particularly drinks they might only drink at home so a lot of sherry consumers are kind of closet (laughs) at home (laughs) sherry drinkers and now they're at home all year and they're thinking we're going to drink sherry all year round and that that really has happened um and in particular i mean the, the thing is is that 
Sherry's always been relatively seasonal. There is an uptick in, in the kind of winter months and the Christmas months, and that's just historically how the patterns have worked. So of course, um, you know, we, we did still see that uptick of at-home consumption over Christmas, and it hasn't tailed off in the way that other categories have, so that's really positive. Um, you know, Martin Skelton, who's the managing director of Gonzalez Bias and, and who I worked with many years ago, you know, he, he's been on the record recently saying for the first time in 20 years, he's seeing significant value and volume growth for, for their brands, which I think is a great, you know, um, sort of great weather bait for, for where we're going. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, again, you get kind of major retailers, um, you know, the Majestic Wines of this world, all talking about how Sherry is this kind of this success story. So, you know, again, I feel oh, while, while Zecco wasn't able to fully capitalize on this sort of uptick, I think that the, 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 the everything is swinging in the right direction. Mm -hmm. uh, people are, I've kind of wised up to, to Sherry's relevance to them and how they can use it. And certainly, although, although Zecco hasn't seen, you know, massive kind of sales growth in 2020 from a sort of awareness point of view, I'm really pleased to say that, you know, we are, you know, people are really noticing what we're doing and, and seemingly yeah. really celebrating it. And the truth about Sherry is that I think once you get bitten by the Sherry bug, you're firmly bitten, which is great. I mean, it may be a small community, but it's a very passionate community. And the number of people that I, you know, I speak to who are just so excited to see what we're doing and who've been really waiting for a brand like ours to tell this, to tell this story. And indeed, even in my, um, in the article, which I've, which I've written, you know, I, I had, everyone was so willing to contribute their soundbite on what wow. Sherry means to them and why it's so important for them. So I think that's testament to the level of passion that exists within the broader community outside of Spain for, for this category as well. I wanted to end with a couple of things. First is one of the big things we, we do at Napa Valley Wine Academy, we emphasize also our career series and really empowering our students that want to forge their own path and establish themselves professionally within the wine industry. Mm -hmm. And just going back to it being Women's History Month and spotlighting women in wine, um, I wanted to ask you your advice for other female wine professionals, but specifically maybe those that want to get into entrepreneurship. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I think historically um, it's true that sort of wine and, and whiskey, which are the two areas that I'm kind of, you know, very much involved in, have been more of a of sort of man's world. But I think the needle has, has swung so firmly now that I really feel that, um, that the door is open to anyone. I mean, if you've really got passion and commitment and tenacity, you know, no one's, no one's going to stand in the way. I really feel that we, I and uh, I as a woman and our, the three of us as, as female founders have had so many doors open to us, so much um, help and support and energy. And I actually think, um, although it's ironic to use the word fraternity, <laughs> <laughs> but you know I actually think that there is that sense of collaboration and conviviality which exists um and certainly within the world of, of whiskey just to go off point for a minute but you know I think because historically whiskey was all about blending different whiskies together that yeah. is, a, is a sector where there's just a huge spirit of collaboration and working together and, I, and I'm seeing that more and more in in um in sherry and in wines as well. So I suppose my first thing is, you know, if you're if you're passionate about it, go for it. I really don't think that there's any reason why anybody or anything should stand in your way. I mean, you know, it's not without its challenges, but but what is what industry is. Um, from a kind of entrepreneurial point of view, you know, my father has this sort of motto, which I think is bang on, annoyingly. Annoying, <laughs> but that's right. But you know, he says it always takes twice as long and costs twice as much as you think it's going to. And yeah, that's certainly true. So I think, you know, as an entrepreneur, you've got to go, you've got to be prepared to go the distance and recognize that, you know, your first guess is going to be wrong, um, for sure. And, you know, you've got to have that kind of staying power. So it's definitely a question of, of really making sure that you can see the long-term kind of implications of, of, you know, the decisions you're making. Mm -hmm. um, but I really feel that if you, if, as I said, if you can show that passion, that commitment, then people will be, will be able to help you and be willing to help you on every, every step of the way. And I mean, I'm no exception. If there's anybody out there who, who's thinking about founding a drink startup or wants to talk to me about my experiences, I'd be absolutely thrilled to have that conversation. So, um, so yeah, I find it a very, a very inclusive and, and warm and, and warm community. Um, broadly within hospitality um, and actually I think the way the hospitality trade has really rallied around one another in you know in the UK through the drinks trust and all that sort of stuff I mean it, I think it's a real testament to 
to the sort of the strength of the of the sector actually I mean not just at a sort of production level but all the way through to you know consumption and the hospitality trade in general is a very um is a very supportive and welcoming place um but it's also precarious as we've seen you know I learned a lot in that learned a lot in the last in the last year too and so last little bit very exciting favorite sherry cocktails that you want to share with our guests so, um, well, we touched on the rebujito, which um, is delicious. I mean, it's so simple. <laughs> it's literally fino sherry, Sprite to taste, um, some lovely fresh mint leaves, boom. I mean, mm -hmm. so delicious. But, but if you're looking for a kind of lower alcohol, sorry, lower sugar variation, I mean, sherry and slimline tonic is fabulous. Fino and tonic, you okay. know, if you, you choose a good slimline tonic, it's fewer than seven, 70 calories for a kind of standard serve. So it's really clean, it's really crisp. Um, my personal favorite um, kind of spritz is um, actually just Seco ginger. So we just muddle Fino with, um, with ginger beer and, um, and there's some da dash of peach bitters. Oh, really, yeah. really delicious. Kind of like a low fuss, dark and stormy kind oh. of delicious. Oh, I love that. Really refreshing. Um, but if I'm going for something a bit more serious, I love a low, a low groany um, where you sub out the gin for Fino. Uh, again, that oh, okay. works well. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've never. That's that's very interesting. I love Negronis in general. Oh so. well, give it a whirl. It's I'm great. Gonna, I think that's going to be the one that I might make. Yeah, <laughs> my first. It's really, yeah. it really works very well. And then, I mean, if you know, if ABV is not an object, then <laughs> I would go. <laughs> I would go for a tuxedo martini. It's okay. just a classic. And actually, the first tuxedo martini I ever had was in the U.S. at the Grill in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. and it's just lodged in the mind as this drink of perfection. That um, cocktail. Yeah, yeah, just so delicious. And it sort of really celebrates the Fino. Um, and I mean, you know, without kind of shamelessly plugging our brand, we have got a whole wealth of great cocktail suggestions on our on our website. So, you know, if anybody's looking for inspiration, please do go and check it out because there's a whole raft of kind of stronger, short and stronger versus long and, you know, mm -hmm. spritzy options on there. No, that's fantastic. And we're going to have all of that um, available for you guys in the show notes. And again, wherever you get your content from us in the Napa Valley Wine Academy, there'll be lots of links to their website. So you can read more about their journey on their website. And it was such a, such a pleasure hosting you. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to, to tell us your story and share some of those good nuggets of information with us. It was uh, really a pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's been great fun. And I hope we can, yeah, keep, keep chatting about all things Sherry. Yeah. <laughs>